Lamar, all you got to do is come around here and pick me up and I will pop Andrea ass in the mouth for you. It's nothing. girl p hope and a bitch is on time what y'all know about being a <laughs> your bitch is on time now let's give it up for that one time for the one time because i think that this is a first i think this is the first that i've actually dropped the review on the night of the show but um anyway <laughs> don't do too much don't come for me too much because I don't know if I'm going to be able to, you know, keep that up or whatnot. But we got it tonight, so I'm going to give it what it gives. How was y'all first um, week, the first week of 2021, back at the workhouse? Um, Mine, you know, mine was actually pretty smooth because, you know, I didn't let too much bother me. I just did what I could do, and then I went on my ass home. Um, but you know, for you girls that get to stay at home, then you know, I'm pretty sure things were nice and smooth for you. I'm so jealous of you, um, people that could work from home. I'm gonna be there one day, I'm gonna be there one day, but it's okay. But uh, anyway, I hope everybody had a wonderful, wonderful week, and we are gonna jump right into this review. I think we should start with Chevelle and Quaylin. So, we get the first scene with Chevelle and Maila. I think they're at the park. And um, Chevelle just really wants to know from straight out of Maila's mouth, like, um, you know, how do you feel about mommy and daddy? Do you prefer it better with just mommy and you? Or do you prefer mommy, daddy, and you? And Maila says that she likes it better when it is mommy daddy and her and um you know chevelle is a little bit taken back by myla's response i think she expected myla to say well you know my i'm fine with it just being me and you girl but that's not what she said so um on top of her still having feelings for quaylin that definitely pushed her more over to um kind of trying to rekindle things with Quaylin or whatnot. But at the same token, she's still not just, you know, hitting his phone up talking about, baby, I want you back. So um, I can definitely give you your props where props are due, Chevelle. You know, I feel like you are handling him the way that he needs to be handled. And I'm very surprised that, you know, you did not take the Oh my God, let me just give you a second chance. Like, you didn't just rush in to um to give Quaylin that second chance like a lot of girls would probably do. But, um, you know, so she does still have Quaylin in the back of her mind. But she has a trip coming up to Branson, so she ain't got time to worry about Quaylin ass right about now. But she did end up letting Maila know that Okay, well, you know, it's good to know that you prefer mommy, daddy, and you. But, um, you know, just a heads up, in case anything goes left with me and daddy, just know that mommy loves you very, very much. Myla says, you know, sure, whatever, I know you love me, and that was that. Then we pan to a scene where Quailin Ass is sitting in the car talking to his sister. And she like, you know, what's up, bro? What you got going on? Da, 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 da. And he's like, yeah. Um, so I was just calling to let you know that I'm a, I'm headed out. And she was like, okay, headed out where? And he was like, um, Chevelle is on her way to Branson, so I'm gonna go meet her in Branson. And she said, Chevelle, like, what are you doing chasing Chevelle? And he was like, what do you mean? Like, I love Chevelle and I love Maila. That's my family. And she's like, whoa, that's your family? Listen, y'all, I don't know what the hell these sisters have against um, Chevelle. I don't know if Chevelle has gotten fly at the mouth with these sisters at one point. I don't know if she done fucked one of they men. I have no idea why the hell the sisters just really don't see it for Chevelle. But for whatever reason, 
every time Quaylen takes up for Chevelle, they get real puffy in their chest about her. So I would love to get to the bottom of that and figure out like what is it about Chevelle that has them so damn shook. Like, I understand that everybody wants the best for their family. Everybody wants the best for their siblings. So if y'all looking at Chevelle and you feel like, oh, she's not the prettiest or, you know, we know that she's shaped like a damn popsicle, that's okay. <laughs> Hell, I'm shaped like a fucking milk jug. And I pull, I pull them all day, baby. Don't ever get me fucked up. So I'm just trying to figure out like, what is it that Chevelle has done to you all personally that can have y'all this tight? Because y'all not the Kardashians. Like, y'all not around here looking like a damn Instagram model yourself. So, it can't be the looks. So, what has Chevelle really done to y'all? Like, for real, for real. One of y'all gotta talk to me and tell me something. So, the sister is just highly irritated and she's like, I can't believe you claiming her as your family. So, you know, you just throwing your other family away and da 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 da, -da. And he's like, look, bruh, I ain't even really trying to hear none of that shit you talking right about now. It's not that I'm throwing you guys away. At the end of the day, I got to do what I got to do for me. I know where the hell my heart is, so it would be stupid of me to not pursue that. And I, and I get it. So, you know, I know a lot of us were skeptical about Quaylen while he was locked up and when he first got out. We like, look, man, is you really in this shit for Chevelle for real, for real? Or do you just need somewhere to lay your head? But we obviously see that that's not the case because his family is wanting him to be with them and lay his head with them. But that's not where he want to be. You know what I'm saying? He still wants to be with Chevelle regardless of you know, um, whatever she's buying him or whatever she, you know, however she putting it down on his ass or whatever. Because if sex was the case, he could go hook up with chi -Town. You know what I'm saying? If money was the case, he could be out here finessing a whole bunch of hoes because Quaylen is not an ugly young man. So he really does have love for Chevelle and Myla. So the sisters, y'all need to just fall the fuck back and realize that Quaylen gonna do what the hell Quaylen wanna do when it comes to this whole Chevelle situation. If it blows up in his face, then you can be there to say, I told you so. Leave that damn man alone, okay? The sister is highly pissed off and she ends up saying that um, she don't really give a damn about these stupid ass decisions that he's out here making and pretty much, you know, um, when the shit all goes down, don't call her. And because she is going to be there to say, I told you so. Like, she was really tight, y'all. Uh, and I just don't get it. Quaylen lets her know that he is determined um, to get Chevelle and Myla back. Because he made a vow to Myla to be there for her as a father. And he says that that is the joy and the highlight of his life. To hear that little girl on the phone and to be in person with her and for her to call him daddy like that brings joy to his heart and so he feels like he has made an obligation to Myla at this point so regardless if Chevelle is ever going to take him back or not he still wants to be there for Myla because he says he remembers to this day how his father was never there for him so he doesn't want to make a vow to a small child and end up having that same thing happen to them. And I can commend you for that, Quaylen. So, back at Chevelle's house, it's time to go to Branson. And we see my boyfriend. <laughs> I'm playing. I'm playing. Y'all know ever since D-Mark had that damn red jogging suit on, I've been looking at him a little different or whatever. But, I'm going to let him live. So, anyway, um, him and Chevelle and Myla are actually the ones that are taking the trip to Branson. Chevelle tells us that the initial trip was supposed to be a family trip, which was Myla, her, and Quaylen. But, since the breakup, you know, <laughs> she's like, it's whatever. 
Bruh, if you ain't going, then you just ain't going. And I'll take Cuzzo and we'll go on and have a good time. So they're riding, they're in the car, they're chilling or whatever. And you know, of course, um, D-Mark is completely uh, animated. And he like, so, you know, it's good that you getting out. Um, you about to get your groove back, you know what I'm saying? You need to get out and see new things and meet new people. So she's like, yeah, you know, speaking of getting out and doing my thing, I have actually been out on a date. And he was like, well, you've been out on a date? And she was like, yeah. Um, and I think you might actually know the person I went out on a date with. And he was like, okay. And she said, well, you know, me and Jay went out on a date. And he said, come again, say what? She said, yeah, me and Jay went out on a date. And he was like, my Jay? You went out on a date with Jay. And she's like, yeah, I mean, like, you know that, you know, we've been kind of flirting with each other on and off since high school, whatever, whatever. Like, so we went out on a date and, you know, I had a really good time. He fed me peach cobbler. He pull my chair out for me and the whole time she's giving the rundown of how the date went this man could not do nothing but roll his eyes in the back of his head 50 million times because and you could tell exactly what he was thinking he thinking to himself like man this fool pulled out all the stops to try to smash my cousin and i'm just really hoping that she didn't fall for this shit that's exactly how he was looking. So, you know, in the end, D-Mark ends up asking, like, okay, so after you had this grandiose date, like, where do you see things going? And she was like, I don't know, because, you know, I ain't even gonna lie to you, like, my heart is still with Quaylin. And that's when D-Mark had had enough. He was like, look, love ain't enough. What's love got to do with it? Like, this man did what he did, and you need to be grown enough to move the fuck on. But, you know, Chevelle is still feeling however the hell she feels about Quaylen. And little does the both of them know that Quaylen is en route to Branson. So, I guess we'll find out next week if, you know, he pulls up on them. Because in Quaylen's mind, he's thinking that... <laughs> That she is on her way to Branson with another man. So, I don't know if Quaylen is prepared to pull up with Scrap or pull up to Scrap. Or, you know, if he's just there to profess his love. So, we'll just have to stay tuned to next week to find out what the hell Quaylen gonna do once he get to Branson. Andrea and Lamar. Ciao. Okay. We start the scene with... Andrea and Lamar still arguing from when Andrea done pulled up on him at Uncle Dulo house acting a damn fool. And he like, bruh, you gonna have to learn how to handle me. Because at this point, you handling me. So, like, you need to chill with all that. He like, you pulled up, you trying to slap me and all this old extra shit. She's like, no, that's not the case. That's not what I was trying to do. I was just very, very passionate when I pulled up on you. I wasn't never trying to come at you wrong or, or, or disrespect you. And he like, well, shit, I can't tell. Andrea is still in her feelings and trying to get Lamar to see her side of the anger. She's trying to get him to understand that it's so not cool on so many levels for you to teach our children to keep secrets and to lie to us as parents. And of course Lamar knows that, but he's not acknowledging it in the argument. And I think that's the thing that keeps setting Andrea off. But, you know, in turn, Lamar says, you know, you need to learn how to conduct yourself because... Yeah, maybe I should not have lied to you or kept something from you or had our child keep a secret. But I did that because you don't react to things in a normal, natural way. 
And when he said that shit, I was like, that's what it is about her. She does not react like you either get zero or you get 10 with Andrea. There is no middle. There is no gray area. You either get black or you get white. Period. Neither one of them are really seeing eye to eye in the argument because like I said, Lamar is not, um, you know, acknowledging that he understands why she's so upset. She's not acknowledging why he's so upset. So Lamar goes outside to do his confessional. While he's out there, he's telling production um, pretty much what he just told us. Like, she's going to have to learn how to talk to me better, treat me better. Like, she's always continuously going left. I don't really know how to deal with it. And he's going on and on to the break of dawn about how, you know, he definitely understands her. And she has every right to be upset. But she's going to have to learn how to conduct herself. And it was at that moment that he knew he fucked up. Because the next thing you knew, Andrea had done came out there and interrupted his damn confessional. And I said, well, what is this? Honey, she pulled up and she said, I'm sick of you bad-mouthing me. You're going to stop talking bad about me, Lamar. You just, you're going to stop doing it. And he's like, what are you talking about? She said, I can hear you from the window. And you always out here disrespecting me and talking bad about me. Why do you do that? And so then here comes Tennyson ass and he's trying to grab her by her arm and he's like, mom, why don't we just go in the house? And she's like, no, I ain't going in no house. And then here comes um, Naya. Ain't that the baby name? Um, here comes Naya. She's like, Mom, just just come on in the house. And um, Andrea's not going for it. She's not going for it. So at this point, Andrea is a wild animal. And, you know, he's not going to get to finish his confessional. And it just is what it is. Now, at some point, they did get her to take her ass back in the house, and they ended up doing a confessional with her. And so, she ends up finally telling us her side of the story as far as her and Shantae. She feels like Shantae has a major issue with her because of the fact that she did not know that Priscilla was her sister. That's the answer that she gave us. And she said that she never felt like that was her job to tell Shantae. She felt like that's something that her dad should tell her. And if that's the case, and if that's all the problem is, then I completely agree. I don't think that um, that's something that Andrea should have addressed Shantae about. Um, but at the same time, I think that as you being the wife, Andrea, you should have pushed Lamar to have that conversation with Shantae, regardless of how he felt like Shantae was going to take the news. So, um, yeah, it was good to get just a little bit of insight because we have all been wanting to know what the hell this feud is with Andrea and Shantae. And so, now that we've gotten Andrea's side of the story, I would love to get Shantae's side of the story. But y'all, that was it for Andrea and Lamar this week. And we are pooching right on along. Scott and Lindsay. All right. Now, y'all know, y'all remember last week, Lindsay was out in the yard scattering shit all scattering his clothes and shit all over the grass she had done put the man laptop out in the rain like she's still out here wreaking havoc so she goes to sit down on the couch with her mom for a minute and her mom is like look you know you run around this motherfucker like tasmanian devil tearing up all this man shit why don't you just pack you and molly gray stuff up pack my truck up and let's just go and she's like no i'm not leaving and the mama was like, well, you really, you do realize that this is Scott shit. So he has the upper hand. And she was like, yeah, you know, he might have the upper hand, but I have the violence. And her mama was like, but, but child, my child, violence is not the way. And, and like, and so anyway, what's going on with the whole Terrabelle situation? 
and she says that you know Scott is really trying to push me to the edge and you know he's reneging on everything that he said and it's just really about to push me to the point where I'm about to do his ass some bodily harm and her mama was like well you don't need to be doing that like you need to be doing everything in your power to avoid doing anything that's going to put you back behind bars and she said well I know that and I understand that but you know it's just that I feel so lied to and betrayed by this man that I thought was one thing and he's another that, you know, <laughs> he gonna end up taking me there. So then her mom wants to know, well, how the hell did you and Scott even ever get to this point of being so lovey-dovey? And Lindsay said, what you mean? I ain't never been lovey-dovey with Scott. I ain't hardly never been lovey-dovey with nobody and you know that. And her mama was like, yeah, I know. And she was like, well, you know, what do you mean by that? And she said, well, you know, I question from time to time how you feel about me. And I think that struck a chord with Lindsay just from the way that her face was looking where her mom said that. But at the same time, it was also a look of, damn, like, I do be treating her fucked up sometimes. But she was so angry in that moment of still dealing with Scott that she did not acknowledge her mom's hurt at that time. So I hope that off camera or, you know, one day after she calms down and gets settled down at another residence, I hope that she will um, look back on some of her actions towards her mom and um, just really give her a, a sincere apology because we only have one mom. We only have one mom, one dad, one grandma, sometimes two. And, um, you know, it, it's just important to make amends with people that are very important in our lives, especially when we have wronged them for no reason. And, you know, if I had to guess on it, I highly doubt if Lindsay's mom have ever been, you know, really rude or evil to Lindsay to where she would feel like treating her mom um, badly is justified, if I had to take a guess. Now, in Lindsay's confessional, she tells us that she definitely appreciates everything that her mom had to say and she, you know she did take some take heed to some of the stuff that she was saying, but at the end of the day, why do I have to give up the house? And I'm looking at her like, bitch, cause it ain't your house. Like, what are you saying? If this man decides to put you out, you got to go. Like, <laughs> I really don't understand why Scott has had you there that long. Like, what do you do? You not all that. Like, maybe you all that for him to look at or whatever. But at this point, I don't even know if he really enjoyed looking at you because he can't he can't cuddle up with you. He can't have sex with you. You don't want to talk to him half the damn time. I don't know what kind of relationship he got with Miley Grace. Like, if you, if Scott is sitting here weighing his pros and cons, like, baby, them cons up here and them pros, it's on down the road somewhere. Because what are you bringing to the table, Miss Ma'am? I don't understand. And then you're upset because your girlfriend cannot move on this man's property. Like, Scott is slow, but Scott ain't that damn slow. If you're going this hard for your friend to be able to stay on this man's property, he got to know. That it's, it's way more than you putting on. Like this just your home girl. Nah baby. This not your home girl. Either somebody done put a bug in Scott ear. And let him know. What's up with y'all. Or he just done put two and two together. And at this point he's not comfortable with it. He already told us he don't know Tara Bell like that. So, I mean, fuck that shit. At this point, it's my house, and I'm sick of you having all these friends in and out. And, no, because once Tara Bell moves on the property, ain't no telling. Y'all probably going to be having all kind of parties and shit while I'm gone. Like, no, we're not doing it. We're not doing it. So, what's next? 
But as much as she, um, as Scott is sitting here saying that we not doing it, she said that she is the boss of the house. So I thought that this was going to be the week that we found out what he was going to do when he pulled up in that driveway, but he still ain't pulled up in that driveway. So we got to wait another week, y'all. But that was Scott and Lindsay. Amber and Puppy. Um, their scene was really short this week. The scene starts with Amber and Puppy up early in the morning cooking breakfast. And I think the mom was like washing dishes or something like that. But all three of the ladies are in the kitchen. They get breakfast made. And um, now it's time to eat. So they're all sitting at the table. They're enjoying breakfast. And let me tell you something. Mama got right to it. <laughs> she said, look. How did you sleep last night? Puppy was like, you know, um, I didn't have a whole lot of covers on me or whatever, but I slept fine. And she was like, nope, that ain't what I'm talking about. Like, did y'all sleep with your legs intertwined with each other? Um, was it any hanky panky? Listen, mama is not playing when she is asking about this hanky panky. She is seriously wanting to let them know, like, look, I don't want no pit of pack going on in my house i don't want y'all kissing i don't want y'all titties rubbing up against each other i don't want y'all even sniffing each other too hard because it might get you excited i just don't want none of that in my house i don't want to think about none of that going on in my house i've been doing just fine without y'all bringing all of that lesbianism up in my house the girls made it clear that you know they definitely respected her wishes and nothing went on with them last night and so she said okay well that's fine but the next thing i want to know is like where do you guys see this going are you developing a relationship or what's going on here and <laughs> mama is not wasting no time mama needs to know like look do i need to I, uh, listen it is really making me wonder like what did mama have to experience with puppy before she got locked up like was puppy bringing the girls in and out and slaying their ass in mama house i don't know what was going on but she is trying to get straight to it and get some understanding and so um amber ends up giving mama the same answer that she gave puppy the night before which was dang she's only been out for 24 hours like you know we just taking it one step at a time and her mama was like oh okay so you just you know trying to see where things are gonna go and she was like yeah you know i'm just letting her Fill everything out and, you know, get acclimated to, to the free world. Which, of course, we all know it sounded like some bullshit because apparently it is some bullshit. But we let Amber say whatever she said. So, um, she's completely uncomfortable at the table. So, she gets up and she was like, woo, you know, time to go to work. And Puppy was like, um, it's early than a motherfucker. Like, you, you about to head on out? And she's like, yeah, you know, got to get ready for work. Like, <laughs> you better get used to it, bitch, because, you know, you're going you gonna to have to be up and at it your damn self. So, then Puppy let us know that, um, you know, she has no idea what the hell is going on with her and Amber. She said she would love for anything uh, for her and Amber to have sex, but she's not going to rush it. She's not worrying about it. And um, she also lets us know that she did not expect to feel the way that she feels being out. Um, she says she feels really lost. So I don't know what that means. I don't know if she had like these high expectations of her and Amber being in this, you know, loving relationship. Or does she mean that since the shit didn't fall through with the um adoption with vincent like you know she didn't expect to come home being broke as hell i don't really know what she meant by feeling lost but um she's just not in um a good headspace so um i hope that doesn't lead her down the wrong road and i think that that is her mom's concern as well because when amber got up 
to wash her dishes and get ready for work. Of course, that left um, the mama and puppy at the table. And the mama was like, well, you know, it's going to be some ground rules in this house at this point. So, um, we already know one of the ground rules is no fucking in my damn house. But um, she didn't throw that one out there for the fifth time. She just let that one be. She figured that they, they got that under control by now. But she did let her know that it's not going to be no in and out. It's not going to be her hanging out no all times of the night like the last time. Because she feels like that is a lot of what got her those six years. So... Um, puppy was like, mom, you know, I'm not going to be doing all that this time. You don't have to worry about that. Then they have a confessional with mom and mom pretty much lets us know that she is concerned about the girls being under the same roof together because of the simple fact that she can tell that one has way more feelings for the other than, than you know, vice versa. So, uh, you know, that she doesn't want that to end up being a problem. And so, she really wants to know where Amber's head is. Hell, it, we all want to know where Amber's head is because it's obviously not with Puppy. So, Amber ends up doing a confessional. And I don't even remember what the hell she was talking about in the confessional because all I remember is her phone started ringing and she looked over there at her phone and then she grabbed her phone and she just smiling and carrying on and then it said this is a call from the South 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 Correction Facility you will be able to talk in 2.99 seconds and then she hit Excel and she said, hey, hey, baby. And she was just a cheeser from ill to ill child. I said, what is going on right here? What is this? I don't know. Because they had a conversation. She like, look, it won't be long before you come home. You know what I'm saying? Keep your head up. Keep doing good. Blah, 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 blah. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to let you go. I love you. And she said, I love you too. And hung up that phone. And production and me was looking at her like, bitch, I know you ain't just going to hang up that phone and not tell us who the hell was on the line. And she just started cheesing. And the shit cut off. I said, oh, in true love at the lockup fashion, y'all gonna leave us hanging. So we're not gonna find out who the hell was on the other line um, tonight. But at some point, she'll reveal it. And you already know how the twists and turns go of this show. So that could be a family member. It could be, you know, somebody who she just is bailing out. It ain't no telling. Or it could definitely be somebody... Um, that she's potentially thinking about fucking on because we know that Amber has a track record of getting with somebody or, you know, flirting with somebody, but then she doesn't go all the way. So, you know, she was so in love with Vincent, but then when it was time to throw that leg back, she said, I'm going to stay here tonight. And then, you know, she was so crazy about Puppy, couldn't wait for Puppy ass to come home. Puppy was ready to put that kitty in her life, and she said, pump your brakes. So, you know, it's like, we don't know what you want and who you want at this point, Amber. You a fucking unicorn. We don't know what you got going on. Whew! Our last two couples chat, Michael and Sarah. Um, this was a little bit different from Michael and Sarah this time because y'all remember Malcolm S was just pulling out the driveway when Michael was pulling in the driveway. And I said, oh, okay, well, where is this about to go? Okay, so, um, Sarah S let Michael stand out on the porch and was like, you know, yeah, what's up, bruh? And so he's sitting out there looking stressed and depressed. And he was like, look, man, I just been going through a lot. And I just really want to come over here and let you know that, you know, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm really tired. You know what I'm saying? I've been 
going through it with Maria as she just I mean, it seemed like every time we get in an argument, she just do crazy shit. And she don't care if I get locked back up. You know, at one point, we we had got into a little situation and she ended up stopping on the freeway in the middle of traffic and jumping out the car. Like, you know, that situation could have went way, way left as me being a black man that's already got a record. And it's like, she don't even care about that. She don't think about that. So, like, that's why I'm out here, bro. I'm just trying to get away from all this. And, and, and I'm just done with that toxic-ass relationship. And I just, I felt like I couldn't talk to you about it. But, you know, now I'm here. And, of course, in true Sarah fashion, she was sucking all of it up. Mm -hmm. She loved all of it. She's like, oh, my God. I had no idea you was going through all that. And, you know, I'm just glad that you felt comfortable enough to come and talk to me. You know you can come and talk to me. And, you know, she just, she was there with open arms for him. But, um, now, now let me rewind. Because the first thing he wanted to know when he got up on that porch was, um, you know, do you have feelings for Malcolm? And she said, yes, I have feelings for Malcolm. You know, um, I definitely love Malcolm and we are working towards um, being a serious, stable relationship. And so he was like, oh, okay, okay. And then that's when he went into his whole uh, violin spiel with him and his toxic relationship. So I'm not sure what Michael's angle was. I don't know if... He was trying to soften her up so she wouldn't keep bitching about him missing the court date because he said that that was his reasoning for all of this drinking and the crazy shit that he's been doing and the shit that he's been saying. He's like, you know, this whole relationship with Maria got me doing stuff and saying stuff that I would never do. You know, I don't even act like that, ma. And so, you know, like I said, Sarah was sitting here eating all this shit up. And so they end up, she's like, oh, you know, come on, give me a hug. Let me embrace you. So they have this long, uh, compassionate hug. And it was, it was a cute moment, but I guess I'm just treating it the way I'm treating it because the next scene we get into Sarah bringing the girls over to Michael's hotel to visit him. So, um, she's there and he's playing with the kids, you know, baby rain act like she really wasn't feeling him. She wasn't checking for him when, um, she first got there because he was holding her. But of course she was still reaching out for her mama. And then Sarah had to like get her some little keys or something to play with to keep her up there in Michael's arms. So, um, Michael, that is definitely a big red sign yellow sign i don't know if you need me to take my shirt off and wave it i don't know but um that was a huge sign that lets that should let you know and it let all of us know that you don't be around that baby like that because she's not comfortable with you she hasn't seen you enough um to feel comfortable enough to just chill with you like that because I'm not convinced that your breath was just that terrible that she didn't want to be up there in your arms. It's just that she don't know you like that. So they get into this conversation of co-parenting. And um, so Sarah's asking him, how much longer are you going to be down here? And he was like, I don't know. You know, I, I initially said I was going to be down here for a week or two. And then, you know, once I leave, I really don't know what I'm going to be doing from there. And she said, okay. And then she was like, well, you know, you're more than welcome to come and stay with me and the girls if you would like. And I'm thinking to myself, like, it is you. So all it took was that one conversation on the porch for you to completely change your feelings for this man. That's what you're telling me. But anyway, that's your house. That's your coochie. Them your kids. Do what you want to do, Sarah. I ain't got nothing to do with it. But 
So, y'all, she said that he can come and stay there for the remainder of the time that he's going to be down there. And he was like, you know, I would love that. And then they go into this conversation of, um, I guess, kind of like their past co-parenting situations. And Michael says that he is just don't understand why she can never acknowledge the fact that he has always been there for his kids regardless of what him and her have going on he says that you know um when i was locked up i was there for my kids when i came home i was there for my kids no matter who i was dealing with i was still there for my kids and it didn't have nothing to do with you and in just that quick of a second Sarah said, nope, 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 nope. I'm not doing it. And I said, <laughs> and I said what happened? What happened that damn quick? Well, what happened that damn quick was Sarah said that that fool hit a trigger when he said that he has always been there for those kids because that's a lie. And she said, no, the thing I need you to do is own your shit and be honest enough to just admit that you're a shitty father. And, <laughs> and he was like, bro, what are you talking about? So now they're in this full blown ass argument about parenting and the cameraman is shady than a motherfucker because the cameraman done panned the damn camera on baby rain and her little ass was sitting there chewing on the goddamn hotel remote. I said, take me down, Lord. Take me down. Y'all, the baby was chewing on a goddamn remote. And Sarah looked at the baby chewing on the remote and let her do it. Long as she was getting her argument out, she didn't give a damn. I said, that remote done been everywhere. Do you know that that remote been in somebody's ass? Do you know that that remote done had all kind of goddamn fingertips, fingerprints, cigarette ashes, <laughs> bodily fluids? That remote done been through some shit. And she's using it as a teether. Woo! That shit blew my mind. But anyway, I definitely stood, uh, um, understood Sarah's frustration because, Michael, you're going to have to stop patting yourself on the back for making these phone calls and FaceTiming your kids, calling them pretty girl. A father has much more under his belt than that. I mean, I get it. You're saying regardless of how upset you get with Sarah, you never um, take it out on the kids. You never neglect the kids. Like, you're always still willing to reach out and talk to the kids regardless of how you feel about Sarah. But that still does not make you a good father. Like I just said a few minutes ago, Baby Rain is not even comfortable with you. I feel like Aviana just kind of tolerates you and she loves you because she's been seeing this since she was a child. So she already knows like this is just what I go through with my dad. So I'm going to love his ass regardless. So that's where Aviana is with it. And you know, you, you got to be able to own up to your shit and just say, you know what? I know that I have not been the best dad, but I'm trying my best to turn that thing around. And if you could just say that, I feel like you and Sarah could go a lot further. But if you're going to still be in denial about, <laughs> if you're going to continue to be in denial about your uh, fatherhood and your, and your skills as this grandiose ass parent, then y'all ain't going to get nowhere. Because like Sarah said, she's already went through two pregnancies without your ass being there. And, you know, it's just a lot of things where you fall short. So, that's always going to be a trigger for her. Because she knows the truth just like we know the truth. And so, you're sitting there lying to nobody but yourself. So, fix your shit, bruh. Brittany and Marcelino. We got Brittany um, 
Nope, we don't got Brittany yet. We have Marcelino and his mom at the laundromat. And they're um, doing some laundry or whatever. I'm not sure if that's where his mom work at. Or, you know, if, if they just still have to go to the laundromat to do their clothes or whatever. I'm not judging either way because I remember my laundromat days. Baby, when I got a washer and dryer in my apartment... I thought I had struck gold because I used to live on the third floor. So, you know, going to the laundromat was not fun and it's expensive. So, um, look, I get it. But Marcelino is just kind of expressing to his mom how sick and tired he is of Brittany chasing her mom around. Um, you know, he just feels like it's pointless. And her mom, I mean, excuse me, his mom, um is really sympathetic for Miss Cindy because she says that she remembers her um, alcohol binges and she knows that it's not easy but she feels like the only way Miss Cindy is ever going to get to um, a really sober place and a better place for her and Brittany is to just hit rock bottom whatever rock bottom looks like that's what miss cindy is going to have to do and then she's going to have to have treatment and rehab and um his mom also said that you know she will be interested in um some treatment and some rehab herself even though you know she's already in a good space for now then you get Brittany and marcelino back at home with the kids and they are actually waiting on marcelino's mom to come over and watch the kids while they go over to Miss Cindy's motel room because after that little counseling session, Brittany says that she has been calling and calling and calling her mom and getting no response. So she's worried and she needs to go over there to that motel room and see what's going on because she has a feeling that her mom has probably um, went out binging and she just hopes that her mom is still in good health. Marcelino says that he is definitely not letting his wife go over there by herself like that's a no but at the same time he feels like the whole shit is a waste of time because Miss Cindy is going to do whatever the hell Miss Cindy wants to do and he tells Brittany that he don't know why the hell she's so concerned about what the hell why the hell Miss Cindy's not answering the phone when she's probably just um, you know out in in her elements doing her thing and so he was like so what if she's out with you know the people that she likes to indulge with and she's you know doing her thing and having a good time and she doesn't want to go with you she doesn't want to leave with you what are you gonna do and Brittany was like well I'm gonna drag her ass up out of there so Marcelino is, is, you know, everything is a joke to him about this. He's, he's definitely all the way over Miss, Miss Cindy at this point. But he's definitely a great husband and he's going to always support his wife regardless. So Brittany is the only reason that he's in this situation at all. So they pull up to the motel and they're knocking on the door. Well, no, Marcelino got out by himself. And um, Brittany and the dog stayed in the car. So Marcelino's knocking on her door. He's getting no answer. So he goes to the front desk. He's talking to the front desk clerk. And he's like, hi, you know, I'm here to check on my mother-in-law. Um, I need to do a wellness check. Do you think you can give me a key to her room? Or do you think you can let me in? And the girl was like, oh, no, uh, we can't do that. We're not allowed to do anything like that. So then the next thing you know, <laughs> Marcelino's little slick ass does start flirting with her. And he was like, you know, them some pretty nails you got on your hand there. And then he slips her a $20 bill. And he was like, this $20 bill could make them look a hell of a lot prettier, you know, in exchange for that room key. And just as show as she stank, she said... Okay, here's the key, but I'm only giving you 15 minutes. What? And I said, if anybody from this motel, well, they probably don't care. But I'm thinking to myself, if anybody from this motel 
watches this damn show and saw how easy it was to get in these rooms like the fuck but moving on Marcelino got the key and then so at this point Brittany and the dog get out so that um, they could just go on into the room so it shows them opening the door and Marcelino um, goes right there uh, just past the threshold and Brittany and the dog are still on the outside of the door and um, that's the cliffhanger we will find out what's on the other side of that door i guess whenever they bring britney and marcelino back but y'all that was the end of this episode this is love after lockup life after lockup season three episode 25 if you like this review then definitely make sure to hit that thumbs up button and if you like your girl definitely make sure to hit that subscribe button because i do drop content each and every week other than that you already know i want you to be happy be healthy be safe this is your girl p hope and i will catch you in the next video